So Jeremy, if you don't mind reminding us, why why did you start Fast AI? What was the initial beyond like the grand vision of like how you wanted to help people? I understand some parts about wanting to teach people AI, but like what is what is beyond that? Like what is the end So result we, of on people's lives? we saw that AI, we thought it was likely to be the most significant technology for hundreds of years and will impact everybody in society. And we felt that could go really badly if very few people understood it and were part of it. It could lead to you know, all kinds of inequality and... Um, loss of opportunity for people or it could go really well if lots of people were able to use that technology and benefit from it and and be part of designing a society that uses it so we started answer ai to help as many people as possible take advantage of ai and so we did that by <clears throat> creating courses to teach people how to use AI, which at that time basically meant like training your own models. Um, we uh, did academic research to figure out how to make it much easier to use AI and cheaper, um, faster. And um, so out of that came stuff like ULM fit, which created the foundation of the modern language model movement. And we built software to make it much easier to 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 use AI, um, so that was that was the foundation, and that worked really well. Like most of the top practitioners I talk to today, tell me that fast AI has been part of their journey. Um, um, uh, but I guess what's really exciting. is we're now at a different stage where you don't have to train your own models anymore. Uh, and AI can do a whole lot more stuff than it could when we started fast AI. Uh, so that's why Eric Reese and I started answer AI to like basically go to the next level. basically, to say, well, we can be more bold now, we can do more with this, um, get funding to build a team to, to go even further than fast AI could. And what do you think it like compared to fast AI? What do you think is going to happen with the audience or like the the target sort of persona that you're able to reach in terms of being able to use AI now versus the way it was before? So, so now you don't need to train a model. Uh, and in fact, just like there was a point at which you could suddenly start using the internet without knowing anything about TCP IP and SMTP and whatever, you just like, you know, kind of, it, it, that was possible a long time before the iPhone, but in some ways the iPhone was the thing that brought that to most first people's fingertips. Um, I think chat GPT was a thing that did the same for AI. It meant that now lots of people can use AI without knowing how to code, without knowing how to train a model, without having lots of computers. Um, and that's that, that meant that suddenly we've gone from the fast AI The original fast AI target market, which was anybody who's already pretty good at coding, will teach you how to use AI. Um, and now our goal is to say, um, you know, we, we actually want to basically teach everybody to use AI. Um, having said that, there's still a lot of benefit in knowing how to code. And so a lot of people now are using AI that don't really don't know how, how to code at all. And so we've decided, so 
So two things. Um, fast AI has become, is, is, is now part of Answer AI. Uh, and fast AI, is, so it has access to all that additional resources, funding, people working on the company. Um, and through that, we can now, and they and have now built a new kind of course. It's not just a new course, it's a new kind of course. Uh, this kind of course has never existed before. It's, it's like uh, a course uh, that is only possible with AI. And it's going to teach people who to, to, to solve problems that they previously didn't know how to solve using code and AI together. So it's called How to Solve It with Code. That's the name of the course. Um, and um, the, when I say it's a new kind of course, it's not, it's not just going to be me on YouTube anymore. We've literally created a whole new tool with language models built into it, which people will better use to work through these the, the, the material in how to solve it with code. So we've, we've, we've built a whole new platform um, for this new kind of course. Tell me a little bit about um, the new, this kind of new kind of course from a more of like, okay, let's zoom out from the tools. Let's talk about like the new way that you can teach something or the education the way it's delivered, like how how is this actually different? Like the learning yeah. process. So, um, so Rachel Thomas and I created the first version of the Fast AI course in two thousand and sixteen, and we did it every year or two. The last one was in twenty twenty two. It didn't change. You know, like, and, and I was proud of that. Like it, 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 it didn't change. And like it did the, 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 the structure of it, the method of it, it didn't change. And in fact, a lot of the content didn't change much either because it was very, you know, um, it was not ephemeral kind of stuff. It was stuff that the basics of SGD and so forth that last forever. Um, but I haven't done another course since 2022. And the reason why is I've felt it doesn't make sense to create the same kind of course when the technology has now shifted and the kinds of people that can use the technology is now shifted. It's so much more accessible. And, you know, with language models, the world's different. So I didn't feel comfortable creating yet another course that was basically the same because things aren't the same now, which is great. Um, so this is like the first beta version of this new kind of course. I think things are going to go a long way from here, but the basic idea is like, let's make AI part of the learning process, not a little add on chat box in the corner or something, right? But, but a whole program built in and around AI as part of what is taught and 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 how it's taught. So let's let's uh, talk about that a little bit more. A lot of people, when they think of AI, they think of it as something they can use to do things for them. I think a lot of people don't uh, consider them in ways they can use for learning. Can you talk a little bit more about what that means in terms of yeah, you know, learning with AI? Yeah. Okay. So. Why, I mean, so I think that the question that I'd start with then is, well, why are we teaching a course how to solve it with code when we're saying like people don't need code as much anymore? Like, why is that the first course that we're teaching in mm. this new way? And um, 
you don't really need a course to say like how do you use chat gpt like you can get help with prompt engineering and stuff like that but it's the kind of thing you can like make a start on in a half an hour of reading a blog post like but we've seen again and again uh so many of our friends hit a wall with that approach where they're trying to do stuff that's you know, they're trying to solve problems and build things that go beyond what ChatGPT can like solve in a single step. Um, and it's very impressive what stuff like ChatGPT and Claude can solve in a single step. But, you know, as anybody who's used these tools for a while has seen, there's lots and lots of stuff they can't, um, which is not a criticism at all of them. That's just, that's just how it is, you know. Um, so, you actually do need to, to go beyond that. You do actually need to learn to code, but there's that we've we've developed a way of combining coding and Before AI. Before we go further, can we yeah. linger on that a little bit? Yeah. Of why is like Chat GPT plus coding so exciting? Like the combination of them. Oh yeah. How does it expand the problems you can solve? Or oh, it's what amazing. Is it? Why should you like, care? Yeah. yeah so. If you know a, a bit of coding, right? And if you have a good way, and we've built this way, a good way of combining coding and AI, you can take the stuff that, that the language model is giving you and tweak it, modify it, pull it apart, recombine it, and then interactively do that with the AI to form a dialogue in which you're constantly feeding back, oh, this was, you know, this was a bug, or this actually doesn't quite solve the problem I had in mind, or whatever, but not just with more and more prompting, right? Because that just, as we've all seen, you get into this really annoying loop where you're trying to get the AI to write a bit of code, and you know, it, what it needs to do and you just it's so hard to like sometimes get it to do what you want just write the damn code you know you you like you actually it's just so great when you can just dive in and add a couple of lines of code yourself here and then have the ai add a couple of lines of code there and now it's man and machine combining together and um at least at at, at this stage of history um that's vastly more powerful than machine alone. So, so that's what this tool we've built and this course we've built is all about, which is- And, and a lot of people them. think that coding with AI is just about building SaaS apps or building software, but do you think it goes beyond that into just solving everyday problems that yeah, people yeah. might have? It's, it, that's why this is called how to, how to solve it with code. It's about how to solve problems and actually like, when you're creating an app or a dashboard or whatever, it's just that consists of solving lots of problems. But lots of things do as well. Like if you're doing a data journalism exploration of, you know, organized crime company links based on thousands of PDFs, or if you're, um, you know, trying to segment pathology slides, or if you're trying to understand the uh, change of um, uh, the word literally over time in, in usage through through studying texts online or whatever like stuff you're doing. Or if or you have an office job and you have to make that dreaded weekly report. Exactly. You've got to do your TPS reports, whatever, like, and they have to be done by Friday at 11, you know, otherwise there'll be questions being asked. So, you know, these are all problems to be solved um, and they generally consist of sub problems to be solved. And so if you know how to, if you know how to solve problems <laughs> with code plus AI, then it's this big unlock basically. Um, and you don't hit this wall where you're just prompting chat GPT and getting into this bigger and bigger hole of technical debt as it writes more and more code that you don't understand. And it's increasingly complicated, and it's 
like, you know, full of weird bugs that you don't even know are there because you don't really know what, what it's building for you. When when you and the AI are working hand in hand, then you create things which you understand exactly what's there, you understand exactly why it's there, it's combining your knowledge, your understanding of the constraints, your understanding of the opportunities, your creativity, together with the AI's massive, you know, knowledge base and understanding of syntax and, and all that. So it sounds like combining AI with code just gives you superpowers in terms of using the AI for using AI for a lot of different purposes. And we've seen a lot of different tools being becoming popular, things that promise to allow you to write code without without knowing anything about code. But I think people are getting a bit stuck in those. And they, they uh, can you talk a little bit about what you've observed and sort of explored? Yeah, yeah. The the thing I've observed is that there's this like <clears throat> huge excitement as folks that don't know how to code at all or barely know how to code jump onto Claude or ChatGPT or whatever, and within fifteen or Ripple or whatever, you know, within fifteen minutes they've built an app for their kid which they've had in their mind for years. And it's like Keanu Reeves in the Matrix, like I know code. Yeah. It's very it's really exciting. Cool and they've gone from zero to Mark five. And then their kids like, oh, thanks dad, that's nice. But when I click this button, it doesn't actually do anything. So, oh, all right. How do I fix this? Prompt, 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 like, Okay, the next bit takes twice as long just to fix that one damn button. And then the kid's like, oh, yeah, my friend Hamill wants to do it as well. We want to have a leaderboard. And it's like, and it, it doesn't work great to build and build and build. And, you know, um, this is how, it, like, you look at the real world of, like, who's, building the apps that we're using every day, they're not built by people using who can't code using just chat GPT. They're just not, you know, like 99.99% of them aren't. Because um, we're not there. That's not where the technology it's is not, right they're, now. they're not using AI at all. They just they no. still know how to code. And right. they might be using AI, but they're not as exclusively using AI. Right. Like and nobody's don't. really built the tool specifically designed to really harness the best of humans and the best of AI. So that's what we're showing people as a process and a tool for doing that. So like Google CEO said that most recent, the most recent few months, 25% of their code is generated by AI. Um, and so, yeah, it's a good example, right? Like, they know quite a lot about AI at Google, and it's not like they've replaced all of their coders with AI, but they're also not using it. Like, it's not a, they're avoiding it either. Like, this is where we are with the technology today is it's great to know both. But, like, most of the labs, big labs, have been focused on building AGI. You know, they're really focused on building AI that stands alone. Um, and we're one of the very few groups that are entirely focused on building stuff that combines humans and AI together in the best possible way. So that's why, you know, we've created this very new kind of course and very new kind of tool to power the course. And tell me a little bit more about the tool and the gap that it fills. Specifically, um, you know, like you have all of these tools like Cursor, Claude, and they write code for you. And you can imagine someone saying, okay, I'm going to try to learn about the code by reading what it's producing or asking questions. But I suspect there's something, there's still a gap. So like you made this tool and this platform for a reason. Can you talk about? Sure. So why? the platform for now, at least we're calling solve it. Okay. So there's, so when there's part of this course, you'll get access to solve it. Uh, and Solvit supports a very particular kind of workflow or a variant of a very particular kind of workflow, which already nearly all of the best 
developers I know use. I find most folks who have been programming for more than 20 years or so and are at the very top of the game, they, they have a workflow that very heavily uses a very highly interactive approach. Um, and so, you know, so for example, if you look at three blue, one brown videos, um, which are very popular and very good, uh, Grant Sanderson has demonstrated that the way he builds those is very interactively. He's got this code over here, and he types in a bit, and immediately he sees the results. You know, um, Peter Norvig, who ran research at Google, you know, very heavily used this kind of, you know, similar kind of style of trying things and getting immediate feedback. Um, it's extremely different to what something like Cursor Compose or or Claude Artifacts, or whatever you use, where it spits out like 200, 300 lines of code. Like, there's no exploration there. There's no learning going on there as you gradually build up your solution. So Solvert is designed to kind of be something that creates one or two lines of code for you. And then you write, you know, maybe one or two lines of code yourself. And then like you gradually ping pong back and forth, you know. Um, and so you end up with something that's generally a lot less lines of code than you would have had if AI had spat out this big thing for you. Why is that? Because to be honest, like uh, these, these, uh, language models have not been trained to create, they can't yet create particularly high quality code, uh, particularly concise code. And also like the nature of language models is that they spit out the kind of code they've seen before. So often like it'll have like all kinds of unnecessary stuff that like you mm. would need in some different environment. Um, and so it just ends up being overly complicated and not really customized for your particular problem that you're solving. Um, so yeah, you know, this is really all about harnessing this much more interactive approach that, that really pretty much all of the world's top practitioners use. So like if you watch Andre Kapathy's videos, for example, or, you know, uh, or watch how George Hotz builds, um, you know, Tiny Grad, or like with all of them, you see it's like type, 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 try, check this, see what happens, like two lines of code, two lines of code, you know, it, that's, that's the process that we're supporting, but it's one where AI is part of, you know, helping to generate that code, part of, part of helping to check that code and teaching you also like what for the bits where the AI has written some code for you is like make sure you really understand that that code and why it's written that and, way and what it does you know so some people might think that hey writing one or two lines of code at a time and understanding these one or two lines of code that sounds a lot slower than <laughs> you know, having 200 lines of code written at it once. It does, doesn't it? I, I happen to have the privilege of knowing that you've used this system to write real software. And so what is your observation? You yeah. Know, is it like a lot slower? Because well, we've done like it together, haven't we? Lines? So yeah, so you've seen it. So yeah, so yeah, it, 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 it honestly, for anybody who's been doing the like Cursor Compose, you know, Claude Projects thing of writing hundreds of lines of code, I have a feeling this is going to feel terrible at first. You're going to feel like, <laughs> did I just create two lines of code when I could have created 200? Um, but like, um, to me, it feels like the difference between telling a kid in grade one, hey, here's a calculator. Here's how you add and subtract. Okay, that's it. School's over you know, go start your career versus saying like, you know what, we're actually going to teach you to add yourself and we're actually going to teach you to subtract yourself. And and actually you're, it turns out that that's going to build and build and build and, you know, um, 
Uh, and so you'll still use the calculator. You just oh, use yeah. it in a way more powerful way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and so and and it is slower for a bit, right? But then the kid that never actually learned any math, other than being taught to use a calculator, has a huge limit on what they can do, you know. Or else the kid who actually learned math it can can create things, you know. Um, so yeah, it it, it and and, and it, they end up much faster, right? Because they're the ones who are like, oh, you don't need to go and spend six months doing all those calculations, you know, summing manually all the numbers from one to a million, <laughs> because there's a shorthand, which is this closed form, you know, solution which I can do in five seconds. And so this happens all the time. So when you build the code up slowly, you end up much faster than the person who does it 200 lines at a time, and you never hit the wall of like, okay, that's as far as I'm now stuck. I can't go any further because I don't understand the codes that's there, and I can't get ChatGPT to solve this issue. And so, okay, that's the end. And I've seen like people, when they go from like zero to Mark five so quickly at the start of their coding journey, and then they hit these walls, they become really despondent. You know, this despair hits. And they also feel embarrassed about it because they were out there on social media and telling their friends, I can code, you know, the days of software developers are behind us, you know, like we can just use AI now. And then they hit these walls and it's embarrassing almost, you know, it shouldn't be, right? But it can feel that way because it feel like, oh, everybody else seems to get to use these tools to do whatever they like. And I guess it's not for me. I guess coding is not for me, you know? And so I understand like the best software developers, they use this iterative approach where they write one or two lines of code and they, they understand, you know, kind of they're able to interact with that code and kind of build it up over time. And it's a lot faster. Yeah. One, um, I think even like, so I, I buy into that as the best approach. I think something that's really interesting is it happens that that approach gives AI further superpowers because you have built up a conversation. Right. That I think that part is not intuitive and no one knows about that. Right, right. Because there, are, there aren't tools. There aren't tools that do that. Right. So, so yes. So Solve It knows about all of those interactions. And the interactions are extremely dynamic. And we actually have built a new way of thinking about working with language models, which we call dialogue engineering, as opposed to prompt engineering, which we'll, we'll have a lot more to say about over the coming months and years. This is Solve It is the first time we've publicly released a tool that's built around the principles of dialogue engineering although we've been using it internally at Answer AI for quite a long time now. And everything we built in this course, for example, has be, been built using these tools. <laughs> so it's been a bit of a bootstrapping process here. Um, yeah, when, um, when language models can see examples of questions and answers that have gone well, you know, in a process that's working well, it, it has this amazing self-reinforcement loop effectively that happens. Um, uh, there's something, it's based on something in the literature called in-context learning, but with dialogue engineering, it takes this idea of in-context learning a lot further, where there's actually this feedback loop that's happening. So yeah, Solvit is explicitly built to support this this really strong positive feedback loop where the, the user is helping the AI for its next step and the AI is helping the user for their, their next step. And I think that's the, that's the part that is exciting is, is the AI is actually making the AI do things that are not possible with traditional approaches. Oh, absolutely. Like just using cursor or whatever, chat no. or really right. anything else. Like the level of difficulty of problem that you're able to solve and the complexity that the AI can solve is much higher and almost 
somewhat unbounded in a, a yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I mean, I've been coding. We talk about that? Yeah, yeah, I've been coding every day for over 30 years. Um, and coding a bit for over 40 years. Um, and in a, like, and I constantly try to become better at it, always reading and learning and practicing. So I become a good coder, but with this dialogue engineering approach that we're, that we're building into solve it over the last few months, I've been able to build things that I could not build before. Um, and, and it's definitely stuff that, <clears throat> uh, chat GPT, GPT-4, uh, O1 preview, Sonnet, none of them can do on their own because I try. Um, it's only by combining the, the, the human plus the AI that I've been able to build this. And so it's been interesting for me, like I would say, even for a quite experienced coder, if you're prepared to be a bit patient and humble and learn some new things, you might find this course interesting as well. Because for me, it's showing a process which I've found has given me superpowers. And so, so it sounds like we're going to be teaching students this uh, kind of unique technique called dialogue engineering, where they can really, you know, let the AI do a lot more than any other approach that I've seen. What are some examples of problems you've tackled with dialogue engineering that you suspect would be very difficult otherwise? Um, I'm trying to think. I'm not very good at remembering specific examples of things. Um, the, 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 the kinds of things that I find very often, um, well, so, okay, um, well, here's a good example, actually. Um, the, our dialogues contain messages. This is just something that, you know, um, happened somewhat recently. And, um, you know, I realized it would be nice to not, like in a chat bot, not always add messages to the bottom, like normally happens with chat GPT. But sometimes I'd actually like to, I wish I'd asked a question earlier, <laughs> you know, um, and then that becomes kind of part of the dialogue. Um, and so I wanted the ability to insert a message between two messages. And I, it's like, mm, how do I do that? Because my messages have like a primary key, which is an integer, you know, and like you can't insert something between two integers. And I was like, oh, maybe I should make the primary key a float. Gee, that would be weird, you know, but then I could insert it between two messages by taking the average of the two float keys and and so I started this conversation you know where I was like hey here's some code I've got you can see the issue with the primary key I can't insert messages between them I was thinking of making it a float instead is that like possible and and the AI is like oh yeah that's not actually unheard of at all you know he you know he you could use something like this and I was like okay well is this a known technique? You know, does it have a name? And it's like, oh, it does actually. It's called fractional indexing. And I was like, I've never heard of it. And I looked it up and I, so then I came back and I was like, oh, okay, I've, here's some lines of code to implement this fractional indexing idea, or here's a library I found. How does that look? And, you know, so I ended up, uh, you know, with this better understanding of a whole new kind of data structure and algorithm that I'd never heard of before. And I ended up building, you know, something that I didn't really know existed. And it also gave me the confidence to kind of follow up this idea because to kind of be like, hey, can you make a float a primary key and use the average of keys to add things but like you can't really search stack overflow for that it's very conceptual so yeah um and to try and do that in kind of like a classic chat gpt kind of environment you're not you don't have that ability to to build the code as you go and get the kind of the feedback as you go it's really you have to beg uh you know the model to create the code for you um, and also then my, you know, the, 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 the way we've built this is then the code is, is 
that you're working on together is working in your environment, you know, that that has everything set up the way you want it. So yeah, that would be an example of something I created recently, which I guess I could have created anyway, but uh, my version would have been honestly a lot less good than the one we created together. So it sounds like dialogue engineering not only makes you smarter, it makes you faster, it also makes the AI smarter. What about other people you might be working with? If you're using a dialogue engineering approach, does it change the way yeah. that other people may be able to read your code or understand yeah, it's, what you're it's doing? It's been great. It's been great. Yeah. So we we share this a lot at Answer AI now. We share our dialogues with each other. So here's here's the thing I built and here's how I built it. And we give each other our, our dialogues. Um, and then we can build on top of each other's dialogues by adding more code and more prompts and, you know, sometimes in the middle and, um, the, the you know, the, the version that we'll be using of, of Solve It for the course is quite simplified from the internal tool we've developed, you know, to give people this kind of like, get, get them going with it and not be overwhelming. Um, but over the coming months and years, you know, the, this particularly this group of people in this first cohort, they're going to form this first community that we're going to build out together. So they're going to be the first group of people that understand dialogue engineering. And just like, I think you were part of our first fast AI cohort, Ham, all the folks from that first cohort, as we see, I still know and hang out with. And, um, you know, I think that community is going to be exciting to see how together we we build this new way of thinking about human plus AI together. I do want to add, though, that this is not designed to be a replacement for something like Claude Artifacts or Cursor or whatever. Like, there, there will be times where you do just want to say to Claude, like, just, just one shot it, just make this, and it does it correctly first time, and you don't really need to add new things to it in a leaderboard and blah, 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 right? It's like, um, I have a specific thing I need right now. It's not going to be too complicated. It just builds it. It works first time, and I use it for, you know, it's the kind of thing that, like, Replit works pretty well for as well. Um, let's, uh, let's linger a little bit on the dialogue engineering and how it makes it easier for us the other people to understand your code can you talk about why like uh versus like normal like traditional ways of writing code because you know when you um yeah so the, here's the thing reading a, a finished piece of code is intimidating because it tells you nothing about how it's created you know it's, it's like the difference between watching bob ross paint versus saying, here's the Mona Lisa. It's like, hey, here's the Mona Lisa. Are you inspired? OK, go make a beautiful portrait. It's like, well, I don't know how to do it. You know? Or it's like, OK, here's Bob Ross. He's like, OK, well, I put a bit of paint here, and I wash this over there, and then we can use the edge of this brush here. So with dialogue engineering, you end up with a dialogue. So you see the whole process of building it, and you you understand like why. Was this done this way? What does this thing here mean? Why was this library selected? Um, it's, um, yeah, it's a really nice thing then to not just share with your team, but to also have available for yourself six months later when you've totally forgotten. Um, and so, yeah, it's... Uh, so it sounds like you understand your own code better. The AI yeah. understands the code better. And your coworkers and colleagues understand the code better. Yeah, or as well. students or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're very, we're really at Answer AI, as you know, Hamel, we're all in on this. You know, we've been using it ourselves for months and we're like, holy crap, it's changed our life. So we want to start bringing everybody else into our <laughs> into our world that we're so excited about. Um, you know, because I know you and work with you, I think I have some appreciation of like, 
you know, this is only the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, the these methods of dialogue engineering are really powerful. Um, and, and this course is just the tip of the iceberg too, right? There's going to be a lot more courses. So, you know, we're planning, for example, a, a kind of full stack startup engineering course, you know, and where we'll be building on these ideas to be like, here's how we can use dialogue engineering to create a company, you know, to, to, to do all the system administration, to handle all the email, to build the marketing materials, to, to write the web application, so on and so forth, you know. Um, and you can say that with confidence because you've been building Answer AI with this exact system. It's absolutely. not like you're just, this is not a, this is not a prediction. This is actually Correct. happening right now. Correct. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. So we'll be giving the rest of the world a bit of a insight into how Answer AI is able to do such an extraordinary amount with such a small number of people so quickly. So I know a lot of people are like, how the hell do you do this? You know, you guys must be like geniuses. Sure, okay, we can be geniuses. But no, I don't think that's the main reason. I think we've, we've, we're building some powerful processes, um, which, we're, which we're keen to share. That's okay. all the questions I asked. Thank you very much, Hamill. That's great. I will see you over in chat. Okay. All right. See you.